Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Two Guys Exploring Christianity. Today we have a special guest on the show. I want to say Dr. Professor R.L. Solberg has joined us, and we'll get with him just in a few minutes. But to start this baby off, i got to say hello to my good friend, Mr. Greg not the ride McBride. How are you, brother? Not the ride McBride. I am doing very well. <laughs> it is sunny in northern Indiana. I can tell. In fact, I actually had to turn because your window is open, and I, I noticed that I uh-huh. actually had to turn the brightness down because your your white t shirt really makes you look super oh, super tan. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to look more tan. <laughs> well, you're already you know. you're already really tan to begin with. So. <laughs> I I do get tan in the summertime, mm, but that, that, that's if good. I lived in Nashville, I'd be like really tan. <laughs> <laughs> well. I Tell you what, speaking of Nashville, uh, and this is something our guest didn't know this, but actually, I, this, I, I met my current wife. Uh, yes, I've been married before, only eight times. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Um, I met my current wife there 22 years ago in Nashville, downtown Nashville, right outside of Printer's Alley on 308 Church Street. There was a little place there called Nashville Nights, and that's where we met at. And uh, I was, I was an entertainer there, singer. And anyway, long story short, that was a great place to start off a 22 year journey, no doubt. So, very good. Well, so hey, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm hoping that she, I'm hoping she agrees with that. I think if I had to guess who put up with who more, I'm going to say just as a default safe answer, I'm glad she put up with me. That's probably a, that's probably the right. (laughs) Right, 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 right. Yep. Okay, cool. Well, so before we, I was just saying we'll put doing that. Okay, so before we uh, introduce uh, uh, Professor Solberg in, just uh, for a lot of you here, we'll recognize him from the uh, debate with Rabbi Tobias Singer in Nashville. Uh, it was a really, really nice event, and uh, there was a really, it was really comfortable watching uh, both of them, Rabbi Singer and Professor Solberg. Uh, the way they interacted together was was really, it was it was entertaining on a positive level, and I really, I really enjoyed that. So good looking forward to today. Uh, so. Come on in, sir. How are you doing? Professor R. L. Solberg, how are you? Hey guys, how you doing? Doing great. Doing great. Thank you for joining us here today. This is Yeah, this is thanks great. for having me. Absolutely. Congratulations on getting yourself a nice beautiful Nashville woman. Oh my. <laughs> well, actually in Nashville, not from Nashville. She was actually okay. visiting from Chicago. And so she, know. yeah, so she came down to visit and I was, I was the first person that she technically almost ran into anyway. So <laughs> anyway, so that's good. That's good. But thank you. That's really cool. That's really cool. So how long have you lived in uh, Nashville? Are you from Nashville originally? We've been here. No, we're from Minneapolis. Oh, okay. My wife and I. We've been married 31 years. We moved down here in 2004. So almost 20 years we've been here now. Oh, nice. Nice. You got there yeah. after, after I left, like, apparently. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> Something yeah. like that. That's, that's really cool. Okay, so, uh, so as discussed before, let me get, get rid of uh, part of Greg's tan on this one. <laughs> yeah, the, I think if the sun, I, it, I, you may have an overcast or something is changing the lighting in your room. I'm not really sure. Either way, either way, I'm just jealous of your tan, man. I mean, even with the, uh, <laughs> yeah, of course you are. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get you, you brightened up a little bit. Everybody else in Texas. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Uh, so, okay, so here's what we're going to do. We'll go ahead and uh, move forward with this thing. So basically what's going to happen is, uh, Greg, you prepared a question for a professor, yep. uh, and, and you'll present the question to him. We're going to give him about five to ten minutes and let him just go, you know, and, and really work with that, with, with his answers for you. And then yep. uh, all in the same show, we're just going to, we'll reengage, and it'll either be just you and him, or we may have three of us on the screen again. We can all three just openly discuss okay. it through the rest of the show until we feel like we've really, you know, we're trying to go over an hour, but uh, if, if we have to and y'all have time, we can if we need to. Uh, but we want to make sure that we're not cutting anybody's answers short because of timing or also right. uh, just ideas in general. Because the whole point is here, um, this is this is not uh, set up for, this isn't a, a debate. It's more of, of sharing why we believe what we believe, why they believe what they believe, and try to bring as much information to the table as we can um, without any kind of restrictions. So uh, that's that's kind of, that's the idea anyway. So, cool. okay, so I'm going to go ahead and turn this over. Mr. Greg, if you would like to go ahead and present your question to uh, Professor, okay. that would be great. I will. I sent it to you in a, in a form. I'll just read it, what I sent. Um, what Hebrew scriptures are Jesus and Paul quoting when they tell us that the prophets, that would be the Hebrew prophets, obviously, foretold that the Messiah would die, be dead for three days, and then rise from the grave. Okay, good. Yeah, that's awesome. So, 
Abraham Lincoln famously said, if I only had an hour to chop down a tree, I would spend the first 45 minutes sharpening my ax. So, <laughs> so I say that because I want to take a couple minutes up front to sort of sharpen sure. the proverbial ax and kind of establish a framework, an accurate, hopefully, framework for understanding the, the Christian perspective on this question. And then, and then I will, I promise I'll give you a very direct answer to that question. Cool. So um, Jews and Christians both believe that the Tanakh is the inspired word of God and it's scripture and it's true, right? But there is a, a fundamental difference in how we read it. So do you remember the movie, The Sixth Sense? It came out like Correct. 20 years ago, right? Yeah. And, and oh, yeah, that was a great Bruce movie. Willis. Bruce Willis. Yeah. Yes, Bruce Willis. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's an M. Night Shyamalan movie. Yep. Yeah. So in this, in the movie, if you remember, the little boy's having all those really scary visions, right? And so his mom hires Bruce Willis, the psychologist, to, to kind of help him out, right? And so throughout the movie, they are, they're kind of interacting and, and working together on, on this issue. And then near the end of the movie, I'm sure you remember it, there's this right. mind-blowing revelation, right? You remember the, the trailer for the film? So like the little right. boy, uh, who's a Haley Joel Osment, he looks at the camera in the movie trailers and he's got tears in his eyes and he says, I see dead people. Right. Remember that? And I remember that. that was yeah. coming. I mean, that blew, <laughs> that blew you away. I saw it in the theater. Right. Yeah. So there was this revelation out of the blue and you're thinking, wait a second, that guy was dead the whole time? Like you, you, didn't, right. you didn't even know. But Correct. the reason I bring that up is because what's interesting is that if you then watch the movie again, which I did, now knowing that the psychologist was dead the whole time, right. you start to notice all these clues that were sitting there in plain sight. You, you just you didn't right. realize what they meant. So, for example, like when the psychologist and his wife are standing next to each other and she's being kind of cold and distant to him, like when they're right next to each other. Right. You, you watch that and you go, oh, she wasn't angry at him or ignoring him, right? She just couldn't see him because he's dead. And right. so here's the thing. The revelation at the end of that film didn't make the first part of the movie untrue or, or even change its meaning, right? In a sense, it made it even more true. Knowing that the psychologist was dead, right? And, and then and seeing it again, now you can kind of understand what was really going on. And the same thing is true about Jesus. He is the revelation that allows us to understand this, this deeper level of what's going on in the Tanakh. He doesn't change anything. He makes it even more true. So when we go back now and read the Tanakh with the knowledge that Jesus was the promised Messiah, we begin to notice all these clues that have been sitting there for centuries. And, and, and this is just the intertextuality that the rabbis taught us, right? Every book of the Bible connects with and, 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 and touches on prior writings and revelations and, and they echo on, uh, echo and comment on uh, uh, what came before and even interpret what came before. So you've got like, like a common theme in early rabbinic literature, right? Like Shemot Rabbah is a great example, is that when God gave Moses the Torah, it implicitly contained every idea that would be, you know, later voiced by the prophets and the sages and Christians believe by Jesus and the apostles and the New Testament authors. So, for example, the book of Joshua not only follows Deuteronomy, it interprets it. And then Isaiah interprets Joshua and so on all the way into the New Testament, which in turn echoes and comments on and interprets the Tanakh. So with that in mind, let me now directly address the question that you asked. So okay. from, from the Christian perspective, in light of the revelation of Jesus, we see the death and resurrection of the Messiah spoken of in Isaiah 53, 8 through 10, which prophesied that he would, quote, be cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death. And then it goes on to say in verse 10, when his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. Now, if you're asking for a, a passage that contains an explicit prediction that the Messiah will rise from the dead on the third day, well, as far as I know, there are none. However, as the rabbis and sages teach us, 
The Tanakh communicates truth in many more ways than just explicit predictions, right? It also speaks and teaches through through symbolism and, and typology and poetry and, and narrative patterns and thematic development and and metaphors and personification. And you get the idea. Right, so yeah. guess what? In the Tanakh, there is a clear pattern of God doing redemptive and even resurrection things on the third day. And let me give you four quick examples. So okay. Genesis 22 reveals that God spared Isaac on the third day. And, and where God brought Isaac back from the dead on the third day in a figurative way, he would later bring Jesus back from the dead on the third day in a literal way. So, so Isaac prefigured the sacrificial death and resurrection of Jesus. Or here's another example. How about the greatest manifestation of God's presence in the entire Tanakh, right? When the Lord descended on Mount Sinai. Exodus 19.11 says, For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in sight of all the people, right? And we also see the raising of Israel on the third day. In Ezekiel's vision of the, the Valley of Dry Bones, he describes the regathering of God's people from Babylon as a, as a type of resurrection, right? Ezekiel 37, 12, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. That's resurrection language. And, and Hosea 6, 2 describes the time frame of that resurrection. It says, on the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. And lastly, there's the big one. Right, the connection that Jesus himself explicitly makes. So in Matthew 12, verse 40, he says, For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So just as Jonah was a, a, a figuratively released from his watery grave on the third day, Jesus walked out of the grave in a literal way on the third day. And just as Jonah became a assigned to the people of Nineveh, Jesus was assigned to his generation. So that's sort of a way into understanding how, how Christians who accept the revelation of Jesus as Messiah see the Tanakh's teaching about the Messiah being fulfilled in him, right? And for those first century Jews who were steeped in the Tanakh, for the disciples and the apostles, I believe that these were the pearls that Rabbi Yeshua, Jesus, was stringing together when he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, as it says in Luke 24. Okay. Yeah. So we have um, we have three places that I'm recalling. And again, remember, when I say I, I, there may be more places, but we have Luke 24, we have uh, 1 Corinthians 15, and we have, would it be John chapter 20? John chapter 20 is the place where Jesus says it is written, I believe. You can check that, William. Um, all of the inferences from the, from the Christian Bible are that the prophets wrote this, that they wrote that the Messiah mm -hmm. would die, would be in the grave three days, and then would be raised from the dead. So now... I, I would absolutely totally agree that there are typologies throughout throughout scripture right but it it doesn't seem that the that the New Testament authors are using typology they're they're explicitly stating that this is recorded this is written in the Hebrew Canon and so I Forgive me for struggling with the idea that, in other words, this is a very clear in in the Hebrew in the in the Christian Bible. This is a very clear thing, so clear, and and I totally agree with you that there is nuance. I would never, ever say that there's no nuance, but when it states specifically. The Messiah will die, be dead for three days, will rise from the dead. None of the examples, like like uh, Isaac didn't die, Jonah didn't die. Um, 
they were never identified as a messiah. Isaac is not identified as a messiah. Um, Jonah is not identified as a messiah, as a messiah, as an anointed. So it, it seems to me that we really have to expand. Uh, well, not, not expand. We have to kind of insert certain things into the Hebrew Bible for this to be true. You said that Hebrews or that rabbis or Jews and Christians view the Tanakh differently. There is probably not a truer statement mm -hmm. that can be said. <laughs> but if, if the Hebrew Bible was only given to the Jewish people, and if Christian people couldn't even read the Jewish Bible, uh, even late into the second, third, and fourth century, how could how could they know stuff that the rabbis don't know? Mm -hmm. that's, that's yeah, I mean that's a good a, question. That, you, yeah, I, I I feel the the force of what you're saying. I, um, yeah, I guess there's a couple things I would say about that. Uh, okay. First of all. Um, just a real quick correction, that the Septuagint was created a couple centuries before Christ. And the reason, now the Septuagint, for those who don't know, it's just a Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. And the reason that that was created was because there were so many Jewish people who were no longer speaking Hebrew or could no longer read Hebrew. So they created the Septuagint in Alexandria so that all of the Jews in the, the diaspora would be able to read their own scriptures. And that is largely what the New Testament authors, not largely, they, they relied on it to a great degree. They relied on the, the, the Masoretic text as well as the Septuagint. So it wasn't so much a question of, because I what I think happens sometimes is we forget how completely brilliant people were back in antiquity. We tend to think that we know more today, but I mean, there were, there were Greek philosophers that were figuring out the circumference of the earth 400 BC, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? They're predicting eclipses right. and things. So Correct. Yeah. And so, and of course, we all know the the rich history of of the Jewish rabbis and sages who were who would just take the Torah and turn it over and turn it over and mine right. it for all these depths of wisdom. So, um, that kind of leads me to my maybe my second response, and maybe it's a little bit. I, I feel like I think unintentionally uh, there's a little bit of of anachronism going on where we are perhaps importing modern day precision into an ancient text. Where, where that level of precision wasn't expected of the readers, nor was it intended by the writers. So when we read a phrase like, as it is written, um, in a sense, it's literally true, because even if, even if we're talking about typology, where do you find that typology? It's in the written text. You, what we're not finding is the actual, like, give me this specific prediction. You know, Isaiah says, right. and the Messiah will rise, die and rise on the third day, right? You, I agree right. with you that we don't have that kind of direct statement. You know, in, the, in, okay. the issue yeah. that I find yeah. with that with that concept, though, is, is throughout the Torah, wherever there's anything that would require the death penalty, it's, it's, it's pretty specific for the most part that it's laid out. You do this, then you're going to die. You know what I mean? Right. As, as a warning. So if the greatest uh, if the greatest death penalty of all is eternal condemnation, you would think that God would also be very clear in the warning saying, now these laws will be done away with eventually and there will be a, a guy, I'm sending a guy, this will be, it's going to be my prophet or even my son, however you want to word it, and have right. that clear warning there. I mean, it, it doesn't even have, to me, it doesn't really have any logic. Uh, even like in our modern world, you know, it's like if they if they change a, the the speed limit on I thirty five from from seventy to ninety, they're going to broadcast it all over the news. Or if they reduce the speed because that, that could create a dangerous situation, they're going to broadcast it everywhere to make sure nobody makes a mistake. I right. mean, because you know Hashem's not going to to set a booby trap and hope we fall into it. Uh, oh, or, or or encode yeah. something right. that has a death penalty to where we would have to figure it out on our own. Um, that's that that's that deadly. You know what I mean? Yeah. Sure. Right. Yeah, but again, I, I would I would um, speak to the the level of precision that you're asking for because there's the there's the concept that we see even just in the Tanakh of of what theologians call progressive revelation. Right? God 
God tells us what we need to know on an as-needed basis. He's Hashem, we're his creatures, we don't need to know everything all at once. So, for example, in the garden, when, when we read it in Genesis 3.15, God's con condemning the serpent, nobody knew at the time that that was referring to the Messiah later, right? That that was what Christians would later call the Proto-Evangelium, right? The first gospel about how the seed of the woman, a human being, someone descended, would crush the head of the serpent. Um, we also don't know that's what, exactly what's going on with Isaac, who prefigures Jesus. So there's all these clues that are left along the way that I totally agree. If we, it, it's like the sixth sense, you know, if we say, I'm going to reject, I, I'm going to stop watching the movie at 15 minutes before the end, and, and that's all I want to watch, and I, I don't accept the end of the movie. I realize that's, that's right. a little bit of a flawed analogy, but you can understand how you might draw yeah. different conclusions. Well, my, my theory on that still kind of stems in the same direction is that um, there are verses throughout Tanakh that are very clear, but it points away from Christianity, though. You know what I mean? So if you have shady ones that might point to him, but you have very specific ones that point away, the natural response would be to turn away. That it wouldn't be to go to the the other things, you know. It would be to yeah. to, to actually sure. follow those things that are clear, you know what I mean. So as a well, as a yeah. warning. So and one in particular, you had mentioned uh, uh, in Matthew twelve uh, that one that one ver in verse forty we talked about Jonas's three A's in, oh. in the belly of the well, and then uh, but if, if if we look up a little higher on verse thirty uh, verse thirty two, uh, it's it says whosoever speaks the words against the Son of Man, it shall it shall be forget blood. Talk basically using the words the phrase son of man right um so right. over a hundred times in the new testament jesus is referred to as the son of man but yeah it's his, it's his favorite moniker for himself which is really wild because yeah. uh because in uh i believe it's in psalms 146 or 144 uh, i can't find it now yeah, it literally says, um, do specifically told not to trust in the son of a man. Yeah, well, it's, it just says, of, it says, do not put your trust in princes, nor in the son of man, whom there is no salvation. So, right. for, so for, for Jesus to so carelessly use that title for himself, knowing what the Hebrew scriptures is, very, once again, it's a very, very clear, super detailed. Um, right. So if I was well, to... Well, that's actually not the only place the, the Hebrew scriptures talk about the son of man. Right. right. Oh, yeah. There's. So, there's. So it doesn't right. mean that that was right. the that was the one Jesus picked. Perhaps he right. picked oh, Daniel. Is, oh. Right. Oh. Okay. Gotcha. But my point is that is this uh, this particular one tells you don't put your trust in it though. So if you combine well, all of them and it talks about them. Out on that one yeah. A yeah. Bit. Yeah. Go for I it. I want to understand sure. from your perspective what do you think that verse is telling us about princes and sons of men? Well, they're they're mortal for one thing. You know, and They're so, more, yeah. yeah, mortal yeah. man. So that'd be that, in my opinion, that's, that's the main thing. But the irony of it is Jesus gives himself that title and there's a warning in, in the Tanakh about it. That's, that's just, to me, that's like a big, big red flag. That's just one of well, many no, things. Is, well, yeah, but what I'm saying is, and this is where I want to dig in a little, if you don't mind. No, I go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So when it says, don't put your trust in princes and the son of man or sons of man, I'm, I apologize. I haven't pulled it up. That's okay. Um, in that larger passage, what what is the reader being taught or to not trust in human leaders and humans in general? To like to not put their trust in humans, or how do you read it? Oh, like I mentioned earlier, it's it's basically the mortality of man because we're all you know, man is is um, subject to corruption, is subject to to sin, they're subject to temptation. Um, but but again, what was the passage again? Uh, I it believe it's quick. Psalm one forty six. Let me look at it real fast. Hang on. Uh, okay. Oh, here yeah. it is. Um, I don't want to speak out of turn. No, you're no, you're good. You're good. Oh, you're fine. Uh, oh, there it is. It's in Psalm one forty six. Let's see, three, I believe. Yeah, one forty six three. There it is. Yeah. Okay. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Right. It's the mortality guy, mortality factor. Yeah. Right. And so, so it it does so seem you're a saying bit that odd. Don't, I I don't want, stop me if I'm putting words in your mouth. No, Are you suggesting no. that what it teaches there is that our trust belongs to Hashem and not in mortal human beings. No, my whole point is this, is that there is a warning in Psalms, do not put your trust in princes nor in the Son of Man in whom there is no hope or salvation. And then this Messiah figure supposedly shows up on air, and knowing all the stuff that, that, that talks negatively about the Son of Man, and he gives himself that title, 
And and the whole idea is to is leading everybody to believe that he's the savior of the world and you're supposed to trust him when Tanakh flat out says don't do it. So regard it doesn't matter even what it really means. What matters is it's like if I said if I used a taboo word that was like uh, that we wouldn't want to put on YouTube, but I use that in another sentence, but I didn't mean it that way, it's still negative no matter how you slice it. You know what I mean? Well, so, okay. I guess that would say one man's shady is another man's specific to use yeah. your earlier reference. <laughs> could, could be. Yeah, yeah. Could be. You yeah. know what I mean? Because yeah. I don't see the son of man. Uh, and I don't think, I don't think the Hebrew scriptures as a whole, uh, create this, um, caricature or this evil archetype of a son of man. And then Jesus came along and unwittingly, uh, grabbed that mantle for himself, not realizing that he was cursing himself. And in fact, I would argue it, it really does matter what the text says in the Psalm, because if the intention of that author wasn't to talk about, uh, you know, the future Messiah. He was just talking about mortals. Don't put your trust in princes right. and mortals. Right. <clears throat> that, right. I think that does matter. Yeah. So in other words, I would reject the idea that there's a curse on the label son of man. But that's that's just my Christian right. perspective. Yeah. So, but Jesus right. called himself the son of man, which means did he believe himself that he was the son of God? That, that, that well, you know, it's question. interesting. Galatians 5, uh, verses 4 and 5 say that he was born of a woman born under the law. So son of man is a way to an homage to his his human lineage. Right. Which is the same thing that we hear in Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman, meaning a human being, is going to do this, right? So there's this human thread, and that's the that's the beauty of of Jesus, is he was wholly human and wholly God incarnate. And so to deny either one, I mean Matthew 1 1, right? The very beginning of the New Testament is a human genealogy of who he was the son of, going all the way back to Abraham and David and, and, right. and Adam. So I don't I don't think there there is, in my opinion, I, I realize we have a disagreement here, but sure. I don't see any sort of um, slight on the on the phrase son of man or even being human, especially since humans were God's pinnac the pinnacle of God's creation. Okay. Correct. Yeah. So I I wanted to pick up and we we should pick up on that too. I my question previously, and you, you brought this up too again in, which is, that's always the case. Um, we... Oh, hold on we, one second, Greg. Oh, sure. Sorry, I was just looking something up. So oh, you're good. You're good. Here's, oh. here's the more likely source of Jesus' moniker, Son of Man. It's Daniel 9, verse 10, right? Okay. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a Son of Man. Okay, so we know not, that in, in the Tanakh, anybody that comes on the clouds, that's that's language, that's holy language for Yahweh, right? right? For 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 Hashem. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. So here we have two divine figures Absolutely talking to not. one another. So I, I would I would argue that Daniel ten is the source of Jesus. So uh, Greg self moniker. Well, so Greg, you were gonna comment well, on Daniel nine. What yeah, was... let's let's comment on let's comment on that. So okay. if, if Remember context. Everything is context. So in, in Daniel 9, we, we've just experienced the beast, the beast empires. And then right. this beast, this fifth person, all, all four of the previous empires are beastly. They're, they're carnivorous. They're, they're, me, they're mean empires. And that's the truth. Then we come to the, in the night vision, Daniel sees one like not a son of a man. He sees one like the son of a man. Sure. The son of the man approaches the ancient of days and he's given dominion. He's given a kingship. Yep. And then we, if we read the next, if we read the rest of the chapter, we know exactly who this nation is. Remember, we've just had four nations that were represented by beasts. Okay. Now we have a nation, a nation that is represented by a man okay and then we learn in the in the three places we are told that the that the people of this nation are the holy people they're the nation of israel we're we're explicitly told that in the in the rest of the cha ninth chapter of daniel you can even um if you if you want the exact reference um it, it's it's pretty clear we we use a king james version and in the king james version it it translates them as saints and that's a very christian idea and that's king yeah. james english is translating them as saints 
but that's not what they're translate. That's not what it's translated as. They are the royal people, the holy people, the holy ones. They yeah. are, they are the holy ones. Yep. Um, and I was looking on the night vision, and one like the son of Inash came, and then in the, it speaks uh, in Exodus nineteen six. We are told that Israel is the royal people, the set apart people, the holy people. Right. This this is right. about this is about a nation that will and the when the nation approaches the ancient of days, approaches Hashem, he grants them the kingship, the dominion. And we see this borne out throughout the entire Hebrew Bible, the idea that when the Messiah comes, when the final Messiah comes, and his name is David the Prince, we're, we're explicitly told this, he will reign to the ends of the earth. He, his reign extends to all the ends of the earth. The princes and the kings of other nations are his gardeners. We're, we're explicitly told that. So when, when we take Daniel 7 and we, we inject this, this Christian moniker, I, I don't think that we're doing right. that makes sense. further revelation. We're, we're changing what the Hebrew text says, what the Hebrew text is understood to mean. When you had said that, when I asked the question, like, and, and I still think it's a great question, and it's a question that I pondered for quite a while. If if Christians can't read the Bible, then how would they know what it says? And you said, well, we have a Septuagint, and Ptolemy the second of of Egypt commissioned that. It was done under protest by Israel. But 72 rabbis did go to Alexandria, and they translated. And, of course, the, mm. the, um, just the first legend five books. is that they— tra- Excuse me? Just the first Sorry. five books, yeah. Yeah, yeah just, just the Torah. First five, first, right. Just the Torah, just the Torah, the first five books. That's <laughs> right. it. They didn't translate anything else. Well, they did so, actually about a century later. It wasn't but the same. They were they were they were, they they were mixed they were, mixed authors. They were mixed authors. Right. They were well, not. So, they were not. They were not orthodox rabbis. They did. It. And Jerome, uh, again, Jerome attests to this very clearly in his introduction to Chronicles. He attests that the three recensions that are available to him, as the church, the the church father. We have the recension of Hesychius. We have the recension of Lucian. We have the recension of Origen. Those are the ones that are available of the entire Tanakh. Those are the ones that are available to Jerome. And Jerome is saying this. So when when we say that when we say that the rabbis in Jesus' day, like the Orthodox rabbis, like they used a Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible that when only they can read the Hebrew Bible, even at this time, where there's no, there's no, nothing written down, and I, I believe that your Masoretic text did not come until around seven to eight hundred. Yeah, the I version believe we believe that. that's right. Correct, the version we yeah yeah. So so they they only had in in the early church, they only had a a Septuagint. That was done by church people to to say that the rabbis would would use that instead of their own Hebrew Bible, which again only they can read. I think that's a stretch. I, I think. Okay, it, let me I, ask a couple of questions about that. Ahead. Sure. Uh, when you say that only the rabbis can read the Hebrew text, what do you mean by that? I will I will rephrase. I I apologize. I should not have said that. Yeah, Yeah, clarify. Only only Jewish people who grew up in their community with the oral traditions could read the Hebrew, the written Torah, and the written Tanakh. Because would it be your opinion that like the Apostle Shaul, Paul, who studied at the feet of the Rabbi Gamaliel, could Paul read Hebrew? So. I will agree with so 
there's no record of Paul being a student of Gamaliel. And, and the one Hebrews in my, kept one very in my Bible. And you, in, the, in your Christian Bible, there absolutely is. But one thing that we don't realize as, as Gentiles, <clears throat> that the, they kept really good records, really good records. And some of the things that, that Paul of Tarsus says would not be something that an Orthodox rabbi would teach. In, in, in the Christian Bible, uh, uh, an Orthodox rabbi would know what was meant by an ox treading grain, uh, who would know what was meant by these various things. And well, Paul kind yeah. of, you know, so Paul moved. So if, if you say that Paul was an Orthodox rabbi, then you're going to have to explain to me how an Orthodox rabbi steeped in the Torah and the Tanakh would come to these conclusions about the Hebrew Bible. In other sure. words, how would he think that in Genesis 3.15, the seed of a woman is referring to somebody who will be conceived without a human male being part of it, when in the 16th chapter of Genesis and in the 26th chapter of Genesis, we are told the exact same thing about Leah and Rachel. In other words, that that their, their seed, the woman's seed, Leah and Rachel's both. So Okay, let me. I have an answer for you, and it'll be very rabbinic because it will come in the okay. form of a question. Okay, <laughs> answer your question. Oh, with your question. oh great! Oh, great! Do you, do you recall how how Shaul's career began? Reaching out uh, to the Jews. It, correct. In the in the in the Christian canon, we're told that he was a persecutor of the church, and that he and. Mm. We're told one of the most fantastic stories that could never have happened, that the Sanhedrin, that the Jewish high court, dispatched him to go do this and to carry out— I think it says he got letters from them. Yeah, like he— He got letters from them, yeah, but like they didn't have any authority to do anything like that, nor— even okay, if they so, would have had authority, they would not have done anything like that. They, wouldn't have, they wouldn't would have instructed have it. it. Yeah, that's not something they would have done. Correct. Yeah. So, but okay. But, so, uh, so let me let me complete my thought, if you don't mind. Sure. Go ahead. The question: yeah. Yeah, How what? How did Paul's career begin? And I'll say I'll say I will give you the caveat. According to the New Testament writings, correct. Yeah. Paul's Paul's career began as a Jew persecuting Christians, going around trying to get them to stop trying to get them right. to kick, kick them out of synagogues. So according to the New Testament, what how, what caused Paul to do a 180 in his perception? Well, that, that, is that, is his, that is his purported introduction to Jesus in Acts chapter 9, right. In, right. in Acts chapter 22, and then again in Acts chapter 26 when he when he goes before Agrippa and, and says everything. But Right. No, here's, I'm just, here's, all I'm trying to do is yeah. agree that the New Testament says that. Right. Well, I think yeah. we agree. Yeah. That. Well, but here's here's what the New Testament actually says in in Acts chapter nine, and I will probably reverse this, and so please correct me. But in Acts chapter nine, so we have we have a very a very isolated event. Okay, Paul's Paul's vision of Jesus, and Paul says it's a vision. He doesn't. He never says that it's a bodily manifestation. But in, in chapter 9, he has his encounter with Jesus. His companions see the light, but hear nothing. And then in 22, his companions don't see the light, but they hear the voice. And it's the same event. And I always kind of liken this to a UFO sighting, okay? Just just for like your 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 Bruce Willis movie at the beginning. So a a UFO sighting is a very unlikely event. Okay? And so I come to you and William and I say I saw a flying saucer. 
you both know me to be a sober mind. I've still never been drunk in my whole life, by the way. <laughs> William's going to change that here. <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> but you say, okay, he's McBride's a normal type of guy. He, I, w- I wouldn't go that. F- I wouldn't go that far. I'm okay, just, that's true. Yeah, he, he's uh, uh, that. It's like in uh, in the jerk in Mart in Steve Martin's the jerk when right. he keeps uh, dropping it down, <laughs> dropping it down, dropping it down, <laughs> dropping it down. That was hilarious. <laughs> anyway, so I say, hey, I have companions with me, and I tell you both, they saw the light of the UFO, but they didn't hear the engines. And then the next time I see you, I say. They heard the engines, but they didn't see the light. So my my initial UFO sighting is kind of sketchy in everybody's mind. But then when my corroborating witnesses, when I tell the story, and it's exactly the opposite, then you both know, okay, McBride didn't see a UFO. Right. William got him drunk. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, and then, then and so when he what comes, if you, what if you didn't see a UFO, but you saw an IMF, an identified messianic figure? But I'm just, but I'm just only, kind of the it only. Here, I don't. Well, <laughs> I thought you were talking about the you. International Monetary Fund. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I guess my point is, I'm not. But, I, I, I don't want to get too wrapped around the axle right. about perceived. Uh, contradictions in the New Testament, because the only response to that is to show all the perceived new contradictions in the Old Testament, in the Tanakh, well, and then well, we all I, accept those and we don't accept the new well, ones. Well, see, so here, me it's if you don't a, mind, a just pointless. I would like to comment on that. So uh, the, the main reason why we find the contradictions in the New Testament problematic is because the, the whole New Testament is supposed to be the divine word of God. Um, not, I mean, God breathed, everything is exactly the way God wanted it written, right? Uh, but in Tanakh, that's not how the, the actual prophecies themselves within the prophets those are specific. Those are key. Those are non-wavering, and then the Torah itself. But everything else is subject to human hands, and it's and it's very clear that that's how it is. So, w- w- there's never been a claim about the Tanakh, at least that I'm aware of, that it is word for word exactly what God wanted written. But it is said that about the New Testament. So that so you can't really compare the two in that regard. Um, you know, like the Torah. For well, example. Where have you heard it said that the New Testament is word yeah. for word? Oh, uh, it's the it's a God breathe or God whatever word of God. That's what every every pastor I've ever been to church for actually says about this. In right. fact, when they say contradictions, well, uh, yeah, but the yeah, just I guess I'm maybe nitpicking a bit, but it's, no, it's okay. It's not like in Islam where they say the Quran is literally transcribed, like like no. you know, uh, like you're giving dictation and it's exactly that word and only those words in that order are inspired. That, that's not right. the Christian position right. at all. It, we yeah. we take more I, of a position think... of dual authorship. I think that the um, I think the church has uh, inflated certainly the um, because you you can go back in our country two centuries and it will be universally understood in any mainline church that the Holy Spirit is the author of the New Testament. Mm-hmm. Well, it's that is not yeah. that's, that's not so much today. Uh, well, I guess I remember. Uh, a show further back when uh, I I believe it was Matthew Henry said that Matthew was a glorified secretary. In other words, that was the that was the that was the position of the leadership of the church. That man's man's role in the authorship of of the Christian Bible was minimal at best. Okay, now, well, I, I can't I, defend I, that. I agree. Position. That's not well, no, no, I, I agree that that's, I don't think that's even really the position of the New Testament, to be honest with you. I don't think, I think, I honestly, think that, I think well, it wasn't until, until it, it became problematic that there were so many contradictions it, that, that correct, that's yeah, when, that's then, when people decided, okay, know. maybe it's not, yeah. but all along it has been that way. But now that it's right, coming yeah. out, now you've got the counter missionaries pointing all this stuff out. Now they're basically retracting right. their perspective on the authorship of the New Testament to kind of to kind of tuck away in that safe zone. Um, I don't know. I, I was I'm thinking. I'm thinking back to like Augustine and Origin, and I, they didn't seem to hold that position. But anyway, if you don't yeah. mind, I want right, to. Sure. I was go ahead. walking go ahead. towards go, a goal. Go. Yeah. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Let me just loop back real quick. Yes, sir. So Paul began as a persecutor of the church. 
in the New Testament, I'm, I'm, according to the New Testament, I realize you guys right. don't agree with yeah. this, but I'm giving yeah. you the Christian perspective. Oh, least. sure, right. sure. Yeah. Something then happened. A UFO, whatever you want to call it. I uh, didn't mean that in a derogatory way. I'm try, I was just no, trying no, to that's fine. an analogy that I could, yeah. Yeah, yeah so. oh, I, I take no offense. <laughs> um, but something happened. Now, if you, the New Testament documents, and Paul was very convinced whether, like we could even disagree in reality and history what happened, but even non-believing historians and scholars will admit, wow, something happened to Paul, because now he's, he changed dramatically, and we've got all these writings of his defending the, the, the Christian faith. So something happens. Paul thought it was the resurrected Christ that he that he met on that road, right? So this is the answer to your question. How could an Orthodox Jewish rabbi write such and such? The answer is the resurrection of Jesus. The revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach is big enough to take someone to go, Oh my goodness, wow, that's what it all meant. Remember, it says scripture says Jesus opened their minds to what the the, the prophets and, and uh, well, I think Luke 24 is the only place he uses all three subdivisions, but yeah, the law and the prophets true. and the Psalm. Yeah, the law, the prophets. I, so my, my argument back to you would be to circle all the way back to the sixth sense and say, Greg and William, I a hundred percent agree with everything you said tonight. If Jesus wasn't resurrected. There's a then there's, I, then, I, then everything you're saying has a bunch. It totally makes sense. To there's me. a problem still right. with here, that, though. I we've, think we've for a, oh. real quick. Um, so going going with that, um, that would be okay if there were not warnings against that already in the Tanakh and in the Torah. The Torah specifically warns against such things. Um, De Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5. If there arise among you a prophet or dreamer of dreams and gives you a sign or a wonder, a sign or wonder comes to pass, wherefore I speak and he's saying, let's go after other gods. I know you're going to say he's the same God, but that's not the point. The uh, point is, uh, which thou hast not known uh, and to serve them. And it would hope, go, the whole point is it keeps going on to say that God is testing you to see whether or not you will keep his His statutes and judgments or not, his, his commandments. And so, right. so it's right. literally saying, if a man does arrive, arise among you, then you're, he, it actually says he deserves to die if he does that, if he leads you away right. from the Torah. Yeah. If, if you, yeah. This is, this is but why so Paul the thing, the thing you quickly skipped right. over is the entire key of that verse from the Christian perspective. Sorry. If he leads you away from God and leads you away from, even as Maimonides would say, if he leads you away from the law of Moses. That, no, that no, no, it doesn't say, no, it doesn't say that. If he, oh, if no, he, second. I apologize oh, no. for this move, but if, my battery's if, about to die, so let me Okay, <laughs> okay sure, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Uh, hey William, let's yes, sir. talk about Rob while he's gone. <laughs> oh man! Hey, Can I'm enjoying. I am Can enjoying you see this that actually. Guy he's wearing. I was. Oh my gosh! I wouldn't be caught dead in that. <laughs> You're a dork. <laughs> oh my goodness! And, oh, thank you. I'm glad you like my tie. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I got. Glad you don't like Here, it. <laughs> here's the that was just for you, Greg. <laughs> okay, good. I'm back on Paul. Here's, apologies. For that. No, no, you're fine. You're fine. Here's okay. the very key that the okay, entire the entire focus of of the verse is you are and and if if Paul were a orthodox rabbi Paul would clearly know this you are not allowed to worship any god that Abraham Isaac and Jacob did not worship and did not know, you right you can't you are not allowed right. so so did Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob worship Jesus? That's yes. the question. Jesus okay, so said you, Abraham saw my day, and he was no, 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 no. Okay, well, okay, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not wanting what someone said after the Hebrew canon was written. I'm wanting somewhere in the Hebrew canon where Abraham worshipped Jesus. That would okay. be okay. That would be the only. That would be the only escape so to speak for Paul's for Paul's revelation and contrast and compare the divine revelations the divine revelation of the Tanakh happens at Mount Sinai to a nation of somewhere between two and three million people the the nation of Israel corporately sees the revelation according to the Tanakh, and, right right correct, so accord, according to the Tanakh, but then in 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 the New Testament it is the witness of one man with with witness with comrades who who change the the story but go ahead who's the one man paul paul is the only one paul you're 
you would not be claiming that the companions of Paul also witnessed the divine revelation of Jesus, would you? Well, it says that Jesus appeared to over 500 people after he was resurrected. So well, but we, but that's again, that's it's non, it's it's unfalsifiable yeah, for one thing. So those, yeah. yeah. Well, so I mean, that's according to the New Testament. But if Correct. you can read yeah. Yeah. the Tanakh according to the Tanakh, which is totally fair, and I agree with you that God right. yeah. presented Himself to the nation, then okay. there's no problem with taking the New Testament based on what the New Testament well, says either. No, 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 no. Here's here's the, here's what I think is the huge difference. Okay. The the Tanakh does not claim to have the support of the Christian Bible. The Christian Bible does claim to need the support of the Tanakh. Right. That, oh, that's not even need the support. It's entirely it from the Tanakh. It, it, you are correct. It is yeah. entirely dependent on the Tanakh. So yes, exactly. So if I am not allowed to worship any god except that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob worshipped, and this this is one of the uh, I, I can't stress how clear this is in Deuteronomy. So where in the Tanakh, because anybody can write anything. My gosh, Joseph Smith wrote stuff that is the fastest growing Christian religion in the country today. Um, Charles Taze Russell wrote stuff that has established the Jehovah's Witnesses as a major denomination today. They all took liberty with the Christian scriptures. So I, I, can't, I can't say that I'm, I'm convinced by the Christian Bible saying that Abraham worshipped Jesus. I need the Hebrew Bible to tell me that Abraham worshipped Jesus. Right. Because just like the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses can say what they want— Christianity can say what it wants. So again, right. I need to know from from Abraham that one thing he that we Jesus. one thing we do know is that throughout the at least through the Torah, um, whenever Hashem, you know, the, our Creator, is actually expressing what His actual name is, it uses the Tetragrammaton every single time. It says that's actually right. my name, right? Right. And then uh, later on, I think somewhere in in uh, uh, Isaiah, it, it mentions that Hashem, that that uh, God was actually alone when creating. There was no one with me. It was me and me alone who created everything. Right. And so, yeah. if it, so, we can't go with the idea that well, Jesus is God, but but that's still a different name. He said by my name specifically the Yud Hey and Vav and Hey, but Jesus comes up as coming up as Jesus or Yeshua or any other name that still can't work because again, it was, it was God's preparing everything ahead of time is almost like he knew that that was going to be claimed. And later on down the road, he says, Hey, just in case it comes yeah. up, make sure you know that I'm the one who did all this. No one was with me. No one was with me. Correct. Right. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's kind of like, oh, good. I have about 6 million paths I could take right now. I, I feel like, <laughs> I wish we had. Yeah, well, one, how long I, t we've been I tell you what, I, I think this is. I think what we might consider doing, um, and one thing's for sure is when we're done here, um, even if I come up with a great verse, I wish I should have added in there. We're not going to end this video. <laughs> we're going to end it. It's going to cut no, it, no. and it's going to be our show. We'll all three of us will share the same information that we recorded. Uh, but I think it'd be kind of cool to to continue the venture if you guys are open for it for another show, I, I would love and then to. another show and another show. Absolutely. So before we go, we've only got a few. Well, yeah. technically, we've only got about six minutes if we want to keep it trimmed to an hour but i wanted to comment something earlier uh when you were mentioning isaiah 53 um sure and so um there is there is a verse that kind of supports um the isaiah 53 9 where it says and he made his grave with the wicked this is uh, first of all this is problematic to begin with so everybody knows that jesus supposedly had died between his death was like between two thieves or two criminals, whatever. And then his grave was actually in a rich man's tomb, Joseph of Arimathea. That's, that's common knowledge. Uh, but Isaiah 53, 9 says something completely opposite. It says he made his grave with the wicked, the tomb, okay, and, his, and with the rich in his death. So this says, so if, if this is attributed to Jesus, it does say it's completely backwards. And, and furthermore, it's also in uh, Zephaniah three thirteen. The second part here where it says, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit found in his mouth. Zephaniah 3.13 says the exact same thing word for word, but it tells you who it's talking about. And it says it's the remnant of Israel. So 
could you comment on that a little bit before we end this particular yeah. series? Um, okay. Yeah, so a couple of things. I'll go back to this, and this might be a common theme for me when we're talking. Um, and I think it's just a natural human tendency, but there is a well-known phenomenon called confirmation bias. And I do it. I commit confirmation bias all the time, and, and you guys are doing that right now too. So I'm not knocking that, um, but what I but I I'm just want us to be aware of it, because the level of specificity. Specificity. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I told you this should be called Greg School. Um, um, specificity that you guys are after. Uh, if that's actually the bar of what you'll need to actually believe something, it's a it's a misapplied standard because you don't need to, to see that level of specificity about things you already believe. But and I so disagree when because say, we're talking about a life uh, or the, death situation oh, here. So well, I mean, this is this is like a life or death situation we're talking about. It has to be specific. Well, that yeah, one man's life or death is a, another man's. So so so, so in okay. so, so let me answer the question oh, a little more directly. Okay, yeah. when you have a prophecy that says something like "with a grave die, uh, his grave in the wicked," I forgot how it's put, and then yeah, yeah. He actually I have it right here. But wicked. yeah, yeah, um, you are the the expectation that I'm hearing, I think, from you is that that it's talking about two very drastically different things, and it's being very specific in the word grave being used twice, and it's not open to the, in antiquity, I mean, my big thing of, about hermeneutics is getting into the mind of the of the writer, the author, their, their culture, their understanding of what they were writing and who they were writing to. You said it earlier, context is king, and I, I couldn't agree more. So when we get into the ancient Hebrew mindset and those categories, even categories of logic, you know, it's so different than what we have today. Categories of precision about time and about and about narratives even. You'll even notice, you read through Exodus, you're like, wait a second, weren't they over here? Why are they here? It's not even chronological. There, there's all kinds of different things going on in the literature. And so when, when you look at some things, you have to ask yourself, is this trying to give me a literal uh, explanation? Is there some parallelism going on here? Are they bringing in other concepts? But now, so, we're reaching so, for, but now we're reaching for those things that are kind of shady and unspecific to clarify things that are actually well, specific. Because I mean, no, it says- no, no. I, I wouldn't say they're shady at all. I would say, okay. and I'm, I'm mm. not saying- what I'm saying is, I think we need to dig maybe, down. Maybe I'm sorry. We do a whole show. Shady on was down shady was bad. What that author might have meant. Can, shady was a bad term. I'm sorry. We do a whole show on, because this is what I've I've approached this with with multiple preachers, and they don't want to do any of this. And I understand. And remember, I'm a former Mister Church. I mean, I was Mister Church, and I could never get any of my questions answered. Is that bigger and, or smaller than Mr. Universe? Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, it's a lot bigger. May, maybe not as strong, though. <laughs> oh, no, I, that's, strong, yeah, that's no. a great point. And, and I guess here's what I maybe would want to say for my closing. Okay. okay. Uh, sure, and and it's more of a it's more of a, a top level positional comment. And it's why I almost didn't debate Rabbi Singer last summer. There is at some level, um, we're coming to this with two different perspectives, two different, let's call them presuppositions, or even we could call them biases, well, yes. all beliefs. And, and, and until we get that disagreement about who Jesus was and whether he was resurrected, more specifically, we're right. never going to agree, because everything you're going to say will make a ton of sense if Jesus is not the resurrected Messiah. And right. everything that I'm going to say will make a ton of sense if he is resurrected. So just like Paul knew was going to happen, you know, if, if Jesus wasn't resurrected, then we Christians, our faith is entirely in vain. Ironically, so to me, the whole thing, the whole conversation wraps around whether he whether or not he was actually resurrected. You know, there's even Correct. there even in lies a problem with the fact that he was re resurrected at all, uh, yeah. because you know, according to Torah law, uh, that's also that would that would also render a sacrifice invalid if it didn't stay dead. Because uh, you really, if anything, Jesus didn't die for your sins. He took the weekend off, as one of my other rabbis would say. So, and, and it's and, that, and again, that's a, that's a clear. It's a clearly everything in Torah has got specifics yeah. that they that have to be followed. You know, the blood has to be spread yeah. on the altar. That would, didn't happen with Jesus. Um, there's well, so, there's so many get things. Back to the idea of typology and prefiguring versus a literal sacrifice well, but, of a lamb. Jesus sure, wasn't a lamb either. Literal. Right? These, but these, but these, these requirements of the sacrifice of of an atonement sacrifice now. Right. These requirements are very specific, and the Hebrew 
people have been keeping that for 3,500 years. Right. Knowing how to do that. And actually, they, and this, well, yeah. Well, 3,500 years. Yeah. So, I mean, it like, stopped in AD 70 when the temple was destroyed, but yeah. Correct. Yes. Because the, the, and that was prophesied by the prophet Hosea that there would no longer be a sacrifice until David the prince. Uh, read Isaiah chapter three, start with verse five. But if you if you took an animal and you offered it to the priest and then you withdrew it, that that was null and void. Right. So, that, well, so was Jesus an animal? It's it's no. it's it's about no, the it's just... about the death itself and about the the yeah. the, the, the yeah. but yeah. the thing is if he if he came back to life the death never actually stuck that's the whole point whether he's an animal or or a, you know a, a tree it, it the point is it it, it, it came back to point. life yeah. so that's yeah. kind of the point so let's yeah. do this because this is this is way fun yes um I want for next show. I want you from the heat, and I, I think I'm owed this, or I, I, I'm not owed this. Why I, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting this. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, I need to know where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob worship Jesus. I really do, because if if they did not, then I cannot. That's that is. That is very clear Torah teaching. And, you, and your scope on my answer is I can only answer from the Tanakh? From, from well, I I really, I, I the, can't. The, yes, that, that would be correct, because I the New Testament. I can't the, the, the corpus yeah. of this answer, because the, the commandment, the, the clear teaching is found in the Torah, and I would have to have that shown to me from the Torah before I could before I could agree to do that because I'm I'm not Jewish but I'm I'm required to only worship Hashem even though I'm even though I'm a Gentile I can only worship Hashem anything else is idolatry according to Deuteronomy so if I could have that we and we've we've still got a lot more to do on on Jesus three day mm -hmm. death and resurrection. And I wanted to touch on that. Um, I wanted to touch on some of the, some of the scriptures that you gave me. I want, I wanted to just actually, I told William before the show, I'm a relatively good reader. I don't stutter a whole lot when I read and I wanted to just read some passages like in Jonah. I wanted to read the passage in Hosea six. I wanted to read some of those passages. Do we have just, time for you to do so that now? Or is it just, is it not the right time? I don't video? hardly have time. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. I wasn't sure. <laughs> I, we're, and and my wife says these shows are too long already. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tried to be brief. Hey, no, you did good. You did good. I think we're the ones that drug it out. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a fruit of the loom guy myself. Uh, so who's Inspector 12? Your wife? Uh, <laughs> She's the one that keeps you. You know, my funny thing is somebody said, uh, this guy said one time, 12. this guy one time, he said, you know, he goes, he goes, I am the man of the house. He goes, but unfortunately, my wife is the neck. So wherever she turns, that's where I have to go. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Oh my gosh. Okay. Okay. So right. let's uh, let's uh, go back and all watch this video together. Uh, it'll it'll. I'm gonna have it air live. You're watching me say this now. It should be airing yeah. right now, 7 p.m. Uh, Thursday this Thursday evening, 7 p.m. Central. Um, I'm hoping um, Greg and and Rob, if you all are available, we can all jump in and watch it and join the live chat as well. Uh, and if okay, not, is it we on can do... the, your Tanak Talk channel. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It'll be on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll make an announcement on my channel too, so okay. people can head over there okay. and take a look. All right. Okay. Awesome. That and, sounds good. And um, you want to? Can you send him a copy of the like you sent me that one? Remember before it aired. Well, I don't need to see it. I mean, I was here the whole time. Okay. So yeah, you were here the whole time. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, no, you left. So I could, you uh, had to leave to go to your battery. <laughs> yeah. the, the only reason I, I might want a copy if it's available is so I could, could also republish it unedited yeah. on my channel. Yeah, absolutely. I think we, sh we should be able to make right. that happen somehow. So not a problem okay. at all. Okay, very good. Well, gentlemen, thank, thank you again you. for your time, and uh, we look forward to seeing uh, Rob.
uh, Professor, we'll look forward to seeing you again uh, on another show in the future sometime. We'll figure out cool. those details. And uh, But otherwise, guys, stay tuned for Greg and I. We've got a, a, our weekly show when we're not doing these with special guests. We have the comparing scriptures that we'll kind of go through uh, on a regular basis. Um, but I'm really enjoying the, the trio setup, so we'll probably stick with that as much as we can. <laughs> we'll call it that for now. So thank you all for tuning in, and I hope you have a great week. Uh, guys, don't hang up. I'll only about about, uh, about a one minute and ten seconds for the close. So thank you all, and we'll see you next time, same time, same, same, time, same place. Peace out. Hello, my dear friends. Hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going, and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanaktalk.com, T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K.com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanak Talk. Shalom. Shafa